All right, welcome everyone to our journey with the book, The Righteous Mind. And um, thank you for joining us on this Valentine's Day. It is such a joy to see your faces. And again, if you ever miss any of these, we are gonna record the audio. Um, in fact, if any of you have dived into the book at all, you know it's a dense read. Um, so maybe even listening to these conversations a uh, second time will be a good thing for us. I was always told by a well-respected uh, physiology teacher in my life that repetition is the mother of retention. So now I read everything I think is important over and over again. It's also because I'm slow of mind sometimes too, but it's good for me. So I'm Ryan, if I, I, I know all of you guys, so I'm so glad you're here. And um, I'm going to have Bruce start us off on this journey into a book called The Righteous Mind. Hey, everybody. So I'm going to co-host this conversation. And actually, uh, with Ryan, I think I may have been the one that recommended, should we consider going into this with Lisa's encouragement? Kind of Bruce once recommended a book to me. Could we talk more about that? And uh, I need to tell you that of, of books I've recommended over the years, and I used to, some of you know from my preaching career, that I would often refer to books and afterwards it was common for people to come up and say, what was that book you referred to in your sermon? What was that author? And they'd wanna know more, which I always loved that they engaged with that. And I gotta tell you in the last 10 years, of all the books I've recommended to people, dozens and dozens in all kinds of settings, Bruce, do you have a recommended book on this or that? This has been the most common book that I've recommended. So I wanna take the first few minutes to tell you why I'm so enthused about the book, even though it doesn't fit the normal category of Christian reading. It's definitely not oriented towards, okay, I'm a Christian writing about the Bible and about Jesus and let's all grow closer in our faith. It very much is not written by a Christian, but it has huge truth that just helps us engage with the world around us. So one of the phrases I used is all truth is God's truth. If it turns out that it's true for a mathematician, God doesn't say, wait a second, that's not how I meant that to work. If it's true, it's true, and God made it that way if it's true for sociology, if it's true for psychology, if it's true across cultures, what a, truth is truth, and God is not caught off guard by that. God did not say, I'm going to box up all my truth and put it into this book called the Bible, and if it's not in the Bible, it's not true. So when I engage these other books, I engage them with this awareness, Holy Spirit, can you teach me truth from this setting, from this psychology book, from this sociology study, from this behavioral, this mathematics, whatever it may be, if it's true, it's true. So I'm gonna give you two reasons that I encourage you to engage this book that are like the leading two related to who I am as a disciple of Jesus and a follower of Jesus. And then if I forget, Ryan, try to remind me, I'm gonna come back and try to tie it in with C.S. Lewis and kind of we could more Christianize this by reading C.S. Lewis alongside of this book written by uh, this author who's not a Christian. So Righteous Mind. Here's the first thing that I want to say. If any of us ever want to share our faith with a relative, a neighbor, a friend, a colleague at work, the only way we're going to be successful as an evangelist or apologist talking about faith issues is by learning to speak in their language, learning to think and reflect in the way that they reflect. The Apostle Paul was amazing at that. And there's a place in 1 Corinthians where Paul in chapter 9 says, to those who are under the law, I can speak like I'm under the law. I understand where they're coming from. To those without the law, I'm glad to converse with them. To those who are living in this kind of condition, to those that are in that. And finally wraps it up and says, listen, I'll do whatever it takes to bridge the gap and make a connection with somebody else so that we can talk about truth together, so that we can live better lives, find Christ, live the way God wants us to live. So any step toward missionary apologetics, any of that, you have to learn to speak in their own tongue. And part of that is learning to appreciate other cultures, learning to find the Holy Spirit beyond just church, learning to recognize God is at work in other ways. 
So here's what I actually uh, did uh, today. I downloaded again C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. <clears throat> and I, I recognize that this entire book is making an interesting argument. There is something uniquely human. We are mammals. We have all the same kind of capacity that other mammals have. We move and we eat and we uh, interact with each other. And we have herd mentalities and all that kind of thing. So this guy is going to be saying in the righteous mind, but there is something uniquely human that we think in categories of right and wrong. Guess what? C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity in his apologetics book starts chapter one by saying, we have this unique ability to think in categories of right and wrong. What is it about us that makes us this way? And then C.S. Lewis follows it up from a Christian perspective and says, the irony of the situation is not only do we think in categories of right and wrong, that this should be right, you should treat people without harm, you should do what is kind and good, you should be an upright, loyal person, you should keep your word and not lie. We have these categories. And then C.S. Lewis follows it up by chapter two, and he says, and the problem is we don't even follow our own rules. We know what's right but we don't always do what's right. What is broken inside us? What is this weird human being experience that we have categories of what we should be doing and we are broken morally that we don't always follow even our own categories of right and wrong. So that's what this entire book is about is he from a sociology psychological perspective is asking the same kind of question but he's not asking it as a Christian. He's saying, 21st century, what is happening in America that we are so polarized and divided in our debates with each other politically and religiously that each of us are using righteous language to argue against the other side and say, obviously, I'm right. And you've got to be stupid not to see how right I am because you're so wrong. How can you not see how wrong you are? And he's basically making the argument. It's because we're not really talking to each other at all. We're just shouting at each other in categories that make sense to me as an individual. Anybody would agree with me. This is right. And somebody else is sitting there saying, I, I don't prioritize it the same way you do. I don't necessarily categorize with some of the same cultural categories you may be using. So when Paul writes and says, I've figured out the best way to make a connection with somebody and have a genuine deep conversation about what's true, what's good, what's right, all of that kind of thing, is I'm gonna to have to learn to understand where they're coming from. So opening part of the book is laying a foundation. We are moral people who think in moral categories of right and wrong. And then he begins to say, so how can we be this divided on what should seem like a simple right or wrong thing? How come it's not black and white? Why does it get so gray? Why does it get so confusing? Why do we end up in different political parties, different denominations, different religions, all of that? So number one that I would say is, if you want to connect your faith to anybody other than yourself, what we have to learn to do as human beings is make connections. I call it build bridges, which leads me to number two. Number two for me is God just wired me as a peacemaker. Remember in Matthew 5, Jesus going through the Beatitudes, one of the very last ones is blessed are the peacemakers. Now that's different from peacekeepers. It's like I will just avoid any conflict. I'll just keep the peace. A, a peacemaker is someone who intentionally tries to build a bridge where others have created walls of defensiveness, where others have shut down, where others can't even listen, where others are so upset that they can't engage any longer. And someone like me, I, it's something about the way I was created. A part of it is how I, was, how I grew up. My dad in rage moments, would be dysfunctional and my parents would argue and just, and there was something inside of me that avoided meaningless arguments. It's like, I am not gonna engage with that because that conflict is not gonna go anywhere good. But I tell you what I will do, I will build bridges and I'll do the patient thing of trying to understand. So even in the moment 
I may not engage because I'm already thinking ahead next week, next month, next year. How can I be building a bridge into that relationship so we can get to healthier places with each other so we can better understand each other? So I consider that so important of building bridges. I jotted notes to myself when I looked down. So if we're going to get to get places like respect, dialogue, listening, understanding each other, how we're going to try to find some kind of common ground. I love, by the way, this organization, Uncommon Good. It's like, you know, there are common places of good, and then there are uncommon places that just God breaks through, and we're beyond just common good into uncommon good. So if we're going to find common good, common ground, all that kind of thing, some of it is just be a good mediator and listener to each other. Some of that, I think, we probably are pre-wired in that direction or not. Some of us are way better at prophetic and confrontation. I'm just going to say it like it is. And I'm going to speak the truth. That's never been me. I am more a bridge builder, but I do think I can learn some appropriate assertive skills so I know when to speak up. And I think somebody who's very assertive can learn some, some bridge building skills from me. So I think I see this book as teaching us some bridge building skills, moving us toward healthier relationships rather than argumentative, uh, dysfunctional relationships. So that's why I'm recommending, and just about anybody that asks me, Bruce, what is happening in our world? How is our society melting down? Why are we so polarized? It is likely within the first 10 minutes of the conversation, I'll bring up this book and say, you might want to read The Righteous Mind, because it's a book that's going to help us figure out how we start doing some healing and bridge building and understanding each other. So those are kind of my introductory statements about how I see it as fitting with our Christianity. I see it fitting with C.S. Lewis. I see it fitting with biblical materials. And I see it growing our skill set for us being disciples of Jesus. So I can give you two examples. Jeannie McCoy is someone that she and I have had conversations. And Lisa is also another one, Lisa Yoshitaki that we've had some of these conversations I've recommended. So Jeannie, I'm gonna to turn to you next and just say, for newcomers that haven't read this book before, never even heard of the book before, any thoughts you have to add to my thoughts, kind of your engagement with it? Yeah, Bruce recommended this book um, probably in the early part of uh, 2000, what year was that? That bad year, 2020. And I was at a point where I was watching what was going on in Facebook world mostly. And I've got um, friends on all sides of the political spectrum. In addition, I have friends and one of my children is um, walked away from faith. And so I was watching this ugliness unfold and I was just really like watching the fact that each side um, took the high moral ground with their argument. I would hear things like, how could, if you're a Christian, how could you possibly blah, 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 blah. And then I hear the same thing from somebody on the other side. How could you as a Christian even think of supporting this over here? And I have to say, I'm a, probably a, a, a moderate right-leaning person. I'll just say that's probably where I've been. But over my lifetime, I've not paid a lot of attention to politics. Um, I've just seen things come and go. And I'm, I have kind of a, a view that now seems not very um, responsible, which is, you know, it's all going to come out okay in the end and focus on my life with God and my, my work with um, ministry. And so as this started to unfold this past year, I would see this, this, um, this incongruence between people that I loved and respected and their views on this one going, how can this be? Like, why is everybody yelling, I've got the right answer and God's on my side. That was really concerning to me. And at the same time, one of our sons had walked away from faith. And uh, our family background is such that we never really talked about politics. We followed the rules. Don't argue about religion and don't argue about politics. You just don't do it. Nice people don't do that. And so out of the blue, he started, we have this family chat channel that we are all on, me and my and Ken and our three adult kids. 
And he just one day just came unglued saying, I need to know where you guys stand on this. How could you possibly, you are complicit with the suffering of millions of people if you go along with the GOP, which is incredibly corrupt. And he just went off. And, you know, like Bruce, I, you know, my heart starts panting, like, this is religion and politics. And I don't know what to do with this. This is really uncomfortable. Um, He has since, you know, apologized, but he was um, extremely concerned about what he saw happening. And he's probably uh, positioned on the left side of the spectrum, as well as having walked away from an active faith. And so what this book did for me was it helped me to understand that there was a way to have conversations about the things that mattered to both of us. And I had been praying for ways to have conversations with him about faith, because that also was kind of like not, they, he didn't want to talk about it. But as we talked about different issues of the political and social stuff going on, I could say, um, I don't think that way. If you want to put me over in that corner, here's what I struggle with. Here's why I'm kind of moderate on this. I don't quite know what I think. Here's what I, as a follower of Jesus, and I was able to present my my faith in ways that I never had been able to do before and to get him calmed down to the point where he could hear it. And so this book was highly important to me because it came at a time in my life when I really needed to understand how it is that people that I love on all sides of it could be so angry and so unwilling to listen. What I don't know is really how to find a way out of it. It seems uh, unredeemable, but I'm probably on the same spectrum as Bruce is, which I'm a peacemaker. That became what I wanted most is, can we talk? Can we express what we think or even our questions? Do we have to have a fully formed opinion? Is there black and white even in politics? Probably not. And there isn't in religion either. So um, I highly, uh, was impacted by this book. Recommend. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Hey, Jeannie, thank you. And Lisa, have you thought I had anything to share with us on kind of what it meant to you? Um, gosh, uh, both of you are so eloquent. So I feel like uh, this is just going to be clumsy and whatever. But I Bruce recommended this book to me when Jeanette and I were studying um, the Bible, we were going through it just on a lot. We were going from beginning to end one year and really slogging through Leviticus and some of the rules and things like that. And I, I asked Bruce for some guidance and we talked about this book. And after reading it, not only did it help with some of those questions and addressing some of those conflicts that I was dealing with from a, a Christian perspective, but also um, reading the political side, I too have friends on both sides of the aisle. And, um, you know, even through the years, and because that was years ago, I have used the tools in here to be able to at least recognize that when I look at something from one perspective, that there are different values that people are putting different weights on. And that's why when something seems so black and white to one person that it does not necessarily come across the same way to the other. One person can see it, it, it's completely black and white. How could anybody be so stupid to think the other way? And the other person's thinking exactly the same thing. And it has to do with those, the way we're, we're waiting and, and putting, um, putting importance on different aspects of the, the bigger question. And just knowing that it's just transformational because it gives you uh, a way of making that bridge of looking at it from somebody else's perspective. Um, so I, you know, and, and as things started blowing up um, this year, um, we were doing the Holy Envy study and uh, was coming close to the end of it. And I just reached out to Ryan and I said, I know this isn't a Christian book. I know it probably doesn't fit, but what do you think about having a discussion? Because 
Bruce, you and I never really talked about it. You recommended it. I went off and read it and never had a chance to have these discussions. And I, I really appreciated the discussion in Holy Envy. And so now to be able to discuss this book with you and get your input on it, um, I was just so excited that you decided to, to move forward with it. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. And you certainly were not stumbling or bumbling through that a description, very articulate, that was helpful. I'll give you one, one more testimony and then we're just gonna open up and say, hey, why are you here? What about this is engaging you and makes you want to be part of this conversation and read this book with us? Some of us may have started into the book already. Some may not have even gotten the book yet, all of that. But I will tell you this, when one of our daughters walked away from Christ, church, God, nothing to do with it in her teen years, and then by about age 30, was really uh, at this weird place of trying to figure out what do I believe, what are my values, all that kind of thing. I recommended this book to her. And I said, I'd love to have a conversation with you. I know you're at the whole agnostic atheist spectrum and that it, church doesn't work for you. You know that I'm coming from a Christian perspective, but let's have a conversation. And this book actually she attributes as bringing her back to Christ, because what it did was it gave her categories and ways to think about things that she didn't have before to articulate and for us to discuss with each other. And one of the moving moments for her in the book, I'll just tip you off a little bit ahead of time to get your curiosity going. He mentions that what are frequently thought of as Republican values in the Republican Party here in America, he discovered those are the primary values in Asia. And this guy himself admits, I'm a Democrat. I'm on the liberal end of the spectrum. I'm not coming at this from a moral religious perspective or whatever, but I suddenly realized that things that I'd been criticizing, how could Republicans possibly believe that is very Asian if you move it into another culture. And that gave him an opportunity to engage it in a fresh way that if I wanna be respectful to Asian people and understand India and understand, then I need to try to hear the undergirding and, and the belief system. And so for instance, family is a significant priority and loyalty to authority is important. Well, that sounds very patriotic and Republican and how dare you kneel before the flag of the United States if you're a football player or whatever. And yet that same kind of loyalty to family and respect for authority in India is an important family value. Everybody enculturates that into their children that you should be loyal, you should be faithful, you should be respectful, you should. And so once he was able to engage that, it began to move him in this direction of writing this book that maybe we as different political parties and different belief systems really could start to heal our land if we understood where each other was coming from. So that's the kind of thing, and it actually was significant in bringing our daughter back to her faith in Christ. So those are some of our introductory thoughts. I'm very curious to kind of ask the rest of you what engages you about this? What made you curious? I'm, I'm curious enough to read the book. I want to participate in the discussion. And I think just like wave or, or click your uh, mute button and, and engage with us. I just find it interesting that the book was written in 2012. I'm wondering how different it might be if it were written in the last four years, <laughs> when there's been more division, in my opinion. Yeah, and I don't have an answer for that, Janet, but you're right, as we engage with it, I think he was prophetic in seeing the direction society was going and seeing it getting worse rather than better and hoping that he might stem some of the direction it was going, obviously, one book isn't going to stem an entire society's direction, but he could see a lot of the meltdown coming. Um, so I can go next. So for me, it, it really was needing kind of something, anything to reconcile the, the um, you know, the political differences and the extreme, um, almost rigid, 
rigidity that I've seen going on, um, like Jeannie, on, on Facebook and things like that. And the fact that when you tried to talk with people about it, it, it didn't work. You know, you I would say something that I thought was perfectly reasonable. And, you know, of course, Facebook is not a great place to have a conversation, but it was just so, so bizarre. It was like not comprehensible. Um, and certainly not wanting to be alienated from family members that didn't feel the same way I did. I thought, well, like I need some new tools for this because this is not something I've ever dealt with before. So yeah, and like Janet, when we looked to see when the book was written, we were like, whoa, <laughs> you know, this is like uh, just kind of at the very beginning of all of this, you know, this conversation and this really, uh, you know, chasm, this dichotomy, so. Well, in, in my life, the divide between um, various points of view have uh, settled right into my close family members. And, um, and it, it didn't start just a few years ago, uh, but more like 20 years ago. And um, it, I appreciate the opportunity to have tools to reconnect, uh, 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 tools that will allow us to, be, to empathize with those points of view that don't line up. For me, it was, um, I, I cannot talk with my youngest daughter about politics or religion. She grew up in the church, but she has since now. And, um, interest, and so I told her about being in this group and, and the book we were reading. And she said, oh, mom, guess what? The company I work for, has a book club and we are starting the same book. And so huh. I'm hopeful. I mean, you know, the company's not a Christian company or I mean, she's walked away, but I'm hoping that this will help open the way that we can, we can talk with each other and express our views and our feelings um, without it getting into a, hmm, I'm not gonna talk to you. Yeah, that is so cool. Thank you, Jenny. That's great. Yeah, Alyssa. For me, it um, being in graduate school right now, there's it, it's very divided. There's a lot of self-righteousness that I see in my classmates and I feel in myself as well. And I really wanted to examine that and figure out where that comes from and understand why it's sometimes so hard for people that I respect so much and that I love to talk to in other contexts when we come to certain issues we can't see eye to eye and why those certain issues can really drive wedges between people that would be perfectly collegial in any other setting. So I wanted to be able to connect with my classmates and understand my own thoughts and reasons a little bit better. Um, Say anything. <laughs> um, I'm mostly interested in uh, uh, kind of theoretical stuff. So I'm, I'm just very interested in like moral philosophy. So I'm here <laughs> for the ride. Um, I don't have a direct application. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Because he describes in this book how he wrestled with, am I really in the realm of psychology? Am I in the realm of moral philosophy? He even describes at the end of chapter one, when he came out with his initial doctoral thesis and presented it, he thought, this is going to blow everything apart and everybody's, and nobody could care less what he was talking about. It was like, and then all of a sudden, a few years later, it suddenly became really relevant because people were saying, wow, there's this thesis out here that says, and it doesn't fit nicely into psychology or philosophy, but he's putting some new things together in creative ways and so he kind of got discovered along the way. Anybody else? What else engages you about this or why are you part of the discussion today? I, I was also like many of the people have mentioned, I was surprised when I looked at the publication date, I thought it was came out this year. Um, and I also has been said, and I feel exactly the same way. I have had more tense conversations with people that I have never had a problem with um, in the past year. And part of it, I'm sure, is the whole COVID effect as well as the political situation. But 
a skill that I thought I had, I apparently do not have in the way I thought I had it. Um, and it's been very uncomfortable. And so when Lisa said, are you interested? It's like, ah, oh, I think someone heard me and I, I need these skills and I need this tool to reduce some tensions. <laughs> not with him. <laughs> Tom, anything to add to that? Um, so I read the introduction in the first chapter and I found it very, very intriguing you know, kind of the way he, you know, pulled some things about from this field, something from this field, pulled some stuff together and gone, yeah, there's, there's, some, there's some interesting insight here. And I'm very curious to see where this goes. And you alluding to, the, you know, mere Christianity, it's like, huh, I've read that one several times, not recently, but I think I want to pay attention to that as I'm reading, because I think I'll probably find some breadcrumbs there. So it'll be very interesting. Good, thank you. Anybody else? Julia. Let me flip through for a quote from the intro that I really liked, if I remember where it was. It was By the way, Julia, while you're finding that, let me just tell you, I'm an underliner and somebody that writes inside my book so I have so many folded over pages and underlines and comments and all of that. I encourage you, treat it like a textbook and use it well. Yeah, Ryan's showing yeah. his as well. Julie, I would, unfortunately, it's an ebook from the library. So it's, uh, I have it written in a notebook that's not here. Um, it was where he's talking about, oh, here it is. I found it. Um, so this past year, I had several conversations with a good friend of mine about how we have, as a society say, you can't talk about politics in any other realm other than actual politicians around an election time and how weird that is since your politics and who you vote for is so closely tied to your worldview and the way that you view the world. And it's connected to so much more than just who you voted for in November um, related to like Bruce, you mentioned the kneeling in the flag and how it's, it's connected to so much more than that one moment, but we don't talk about it any other time. And so I really loved when he said on well, page, page 10, etiquette books tell us not to discuss these topics in polite company, but I say, go ahead. Politics and religion are both expressions of our underlying moral psychology and an understanding of that psychology can help to bring people together. And I think that's so beautiful and, and so true because it's so connected to our whole lives and the way we view every aspect of our life is why we have those political views. Yeah, I think part a way to be holistic. <clears throat> if we're going to be holistic in our interactions and share our whole self with each other, part of how we think about things, part of what upsets us and stirs us, all of that is part of who we are. And when it's unsafe to share that and engage with each other, something, something less than what God wanted for us is happening there. So how do we find the safety to listen to each other, respect each other, you know, some of these dynamics? Anybody else want to share? Ryan, do you have any thoughts on this? Or it looks like Cody's on. I don't know if he's if he can unmute or not. Me? Yeah. Ah, there's Cody. Oh. Ah, Jan, um, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'll just say a couple words. Uh, way back when I studied um, to be an elementary school teacher. Um, and then I minored in psychology. So a lot of this uh, Piaget stuff is um, uh, pleasantly familiar to me, believe it or not. It's, it's weighty, as you said, but it's like, oh yeah, I remember that, I remember that. But um, on a personal note, my 95 year old mom is about as Republican as they can get. And she thinks the words Democrat and liberal are dirty words. And here I am. 
So I talked to her. She lives just in Arcadia, a couple hours away. But I talked to her at least five times a week, you know, m maybe more. Um, but we try not to <laughs> talk about politics because we argue every single time. Mm. It's really hard. <laughs> Yeah, Janet said uh, last time we talked and brought up this book, should I recommend it to my mom? And I said, um, I don't know if she'll be able to engage it, Janet, but I think it'll give you skills to engage healthier with your mom. So you can read it. And as you're reading it, decide, is there anything here that I think my mom would be engaged with or not? It all depends on her. Cody, what about you? And Ryan, what about you? Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, my thoughts are very similar to a lot of what people have said. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in this this book and this topic just because, um, you know, the experience of having to try to have these conversations in a like <laughs> a reasonable, peaceful way um, never really lands. And um, and actually, increasingly recently, has <laughs> has like made me like whoa. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're just, you're trying to advocate for peaceful talk and, and niceness and, and reasonable any discussion at all. And, and, uh, and you become the, the enemy and the, and the, the, the villain in the, <laughs> in the, in the comments. And uh, so, I mean, that's taught me a couple of things that, you know, Facebook, as Beth said, is not a great place to be having these conversations. And I've known that and I still get trapped in that. But being able to <clears throat> read something like this book and have some tools in my tool belt for real discussions like Janet was talking about with family. You know, I, I have uh, mm -hmm. family members who we just dis disagree on uh, political stuff. And um, I, I probably consider myself kind of like Jeannie a moderate, maybe right-leaning, but my family, because of some of the <laughs> things that I do uh, lean away from the right on, things that I'm like, this like as far left as you can go liberal. <laughs> and um, and it's just funny that there's there's no understanding of the, the gray area or the spectrum or anything like that, um, the spectrum of beliefs and I'm just interested to dive in and talk about these things. How about you, Ryan? Anything to add to that? Um, well, I think, Julia, you got me thinking about how I too was raised in a, in a family or in a culture even, or it's like, don't talk about politics and religion until you make sure you're with the right people. And, uh, by by that meaning is make sure that if you talk about politics or religion that the people you talk about it with believe exactly the same way you do mm -hmm. so you go through you know 10 layers of of feeling that out if people are using the right language and doing the right things if you know they're your people and then you can further your own beliefs because you're talking to the right people and that's just pretty narrow and shallow and and doesn't really make us uh humans for the world just makes us humans for our small little group and oftentimes churches can be like that. Um, youth groups can be like that. And adult groups can be like that. And, uh, and it would be sad to think like when we're, I think where God has made us, created us to be connectors um, relationally with him and others. And if we can't talk about the things that are the deepest values on our hearts, which are displayed, like Julia said, in politics and religion, our deepest values and our deepest worldviews, um, then how, how connected can we be with others? And um, I've just really felt, and especially in this last year, if you, if you are a pursuer or a, a catalyst of loving others in this world, that can be politicized. And you can be called all kinds of names by trying to create spaces to love others that are different than you and that believe differently than you. And you may even, as you try to be a peacemaker in today's world, you may be even um, seen or called all kinds of names or people may even think that you, you don't believe in Jesus anymore because you stood with that person with a sign that they disagree with. And, and 
I think that polarization in today's world is, is just so strong, obviously. So, so yeah, when Lisa brought up this book, um, it was an obvious the for uncommon good. We just felt like we wanted to be about unity this year um, because of the one, not because we're Democrats or Biden followers or, or but we've been called that. But I think, um, I think God's kids and his community are about unity, no matter what um, leader we have in office, no matter what political time frame we're going through. And um, so what a gift to have someone who's kind of navigated through um, retaining relationship through diversity of views. So I am so excited to dive into this. And um, I thank Lisa and Bruce and, and uh, for bringing this about. So thank you. So Lisa, thank you again for recommending. Uh, do you think this would be of interest to people? And Bruce recommended the book to me and, and I hadn't even known whatever happened with Lisa reading that book or anything. So I'm glad we're back in conversation about this. I'm gonna lay a foundational principle to the book that is brought up in the introduction and then plays into chapter one. And it explains a lot about why we melt down in conversations with the 95-year-old mother, why we melt down in conversations with our own relatives, why up until 2020 or these last few years, we used to be able to talk about these things. And now they've become so uncomfortable with family members, with people we care about. His opening uh, discussion of chapter one is he says, we would like to believe that we are reasoning creatures and that we are develop moral philosophy clearly through the intellectual process of considering our options, using our frontal cortex. You know, let's come to a belief system that is reasonable and just, and he says, I hate to break it to you, but psychology tells us that the limbic system and the, the old ancient part of the brain is way faster than the neocortex is. And so you're gonna have an emotional reaction so much faster than your reasoning can catch up with. And what that means is we will always in any conversation that becomes uncomfortable, kick into the reactionary fight or flight, adrenalized, what are they saying? I feel threatened right now. This is uncomfortable. The moment all of that happens to us, a way deeper animal part of us, a friend of mine calls it the reptile part of the brain kicks in before the human part of the brain can catch up with reasoning. What he says in chapter one is, in fact, we think we are wonderful reasoning people and the way we came to our beliefs was we thought our way there. What his studies are showing is that actually what we do is we feel our way forward through our emotions and through psychology and through hangups and past and, and stuff that rubs us the wrong way and triggers that set us off that we don't, we don't even know why we're reacting the way we are. We just are. We have this deep emotional texture that gets hooked by somebody else's comment or whatever. And then by the time our reasoning kicks in, we're gonna use all of our reasoning energy trying to defend what our emotions have already told us is right or wrong. And so we interact so fast that it throws us off and we think we're being reasonable, but the truth is welcome to humanity and brokenness, C.S. Lewis again. We all know there's a right and wrong and we can't seem to do it. What is the matter with us? We all think we're reasoning creatures, and yet at our core, we are way more emotional than we see in ourselves, and we think we got to our beliefs and all of this for various logical philosophy thinking, only to discover that's not actually what's happening. So what he does is he creates a group of stories and invites people to answer the stories. Was this right or is this wrong? What do you think? And what he discovered was that inevitably people had a very fast re moral reaction. That's wrong. That's right. They shouldn't have done that. It's wrong to push the child off of the swing set. It's okay to share your food with somebody who's hungry, whatever the story was. But then when they would begin to pursue, why is that wrong? They began to discover the interviewers and the research that they were doing during his graduate school work <clears throat> that 
they would come up with a logical reason to explain why they felt the way they did. But the feeling was there way faster than any logical reason they could give. And they would even make up silly reasons. Like one of the stories he tells is he gives a story and says, some woman has an old flag that's flown so long that it's been tattered and it's all torn and practically apart. So she decides to just go ahead and cut it up and dispose of it. Is that right or is that wrong? And people that are highly loyal and patriotic immediately said, it's wrong. You don't treat a flag that way. And then when they said, so tell me more about that. Why is that wrong? What is it? Then they started trying to figure out like, well, maybe if she flushed, oh, I think the story even included, she tore it into pieces or cut it into pieces and then flushed it down the toilet. And then they started arguing, well, because it would block up the toilet, because it would do, because it would harm your neighbor next door and mess up your apartment building. And it was like, that's not what the story says. The story just says. So basically the beginning of this book is saying, if you've gotten snagged in relationships and conversations that went south really quickly and it suddenly exploded in unexpected ways. And I, I don't know if you've been in those settings when the adrenaline kicks in, fight or flight, what happens with me is my whole body gets cold. I literally will start to shiver. And I sometimes will get this really weird smirky smile on my face that I can't seem to get my face under control. It's not under my reasoning. It's just doing this own separate thing. And I'm like a deer in the headlights. And if you've ever been in those experiences, welcome to being a human being that is a mammal that has these instinctual responses that we all have. Now, part of what this skill set is going to invite us to do is recognize it for what it is. I, my emotions are always going to beat me to my, br to my brain thinking it out. That's just the way human beings are. God made us this way. But if we can get to a place where we calm ourselves down, we try to build a bridge and understand why the other person would have said something like that, what that's about, what's happening in me, why did I get triggered by that? And what's the reaction and defensiveness I'm feeling in this process and they're feeling it in the process and we're melting down together and neither of us are being reasonable. Now, all of a sudden I'm thinking in new ways, like, okay, what just happened in this process? And is there a process we could get to where our brains kick in, where we move things down slow enough, where we become thinking again. And we try to figure out, okay, I'm sorry, something just happened there. And I can remember the first time I was in a conversation with Kate where something had upset me. I don't remember any of the details, but I remember I was in meltdown mode of just freezing and didn't know how to react. And she was still talking it was the first time I ever found the safety to say, can we rewind for a second? I, I just, I, I stopped listening and I wasn't hearing everything you were saying and I want to stay engaged here and my shutdown, it was like I was explaining to her what I was feeling. And then that gave her permission to kind of wind back a little bit and say, okay, let me tell you what I'm feeling then. And just, and when both of us could own the feelings, it's like we're purposely turning on the neocortex human part of the brain that we do much better when we can figure out what just happened in this process and how do we not melt into dysfunction, but become more creative and more aware. Having said all of that, and those are great skill sets we're going to work on with this book and all that, none of that works on Facebook. So I have watched you, Cody. I'm going to target you specifically. You are so wired like me as a bridge builder. And I watch you do the same thing on Facebook that I try to do <clears throat> when I'm trying to reason with people. I'm trying to ask, so where are you coming from on that? What is it? And all I get is explosions back again. And I'm like, what? And then I end up having to take down the whole post because people are just shouting at each other on my post that didn't start out political at all. I was just trying to say something and just, and so I've watched that dynamic happen, Cody. And I've watched others of us, Jeannie and different ones, we've all said like, what is it with social media that we just have lost 
any way to carry on genuine conversations. So as we develop the skill set, I'm just going to warn you ahead of time, it's probably not going to work on social media. It has to work through an actual phone conversation, an actual face-to-face -face conversation, bridge building intentionally. And this guy's going to give us some skills to remind us how we can build some of those bridges and understand where others are coming from. But we're all going to get snagged. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to blow it along the way. So give ourselves lots of grace. Hey, I'm a follower of Jesus. He died on the cross for me. He loves me just like I am. God created me the way I am. Accept grace. I'm going to blow it sometimes, but I'm going to learn and I'm going to keep trying to develop healthier relationships around me. So that's kind of how I'm starting this uh, book discussion together. Anybody else able to engage any part of, of the introduction or chapter one with a comment to make about it? By the way, I'm gonna tell you all, I really like the fact that you're discovering it was written in 2012 Kind of like, oh my goodness, what happened in 2020 with our election did not just happen overnight. Something has been melting down in our society for quite a while that this book came out that many years ago. Kelly, I think you were unmuting yourself. A comment? Yes. yes. Um, I think I'm in the minority here. Um, so I've been afraid to say anything. It sounds, I, you know, I don't know. Um, I emailed Ryan because I re started reading the book and I, I read quite a lot. And I was, my background is I um, was in the reformed faith, but I believe it was a cult and I was brainwashed. And so when I first, what actually drew me to say, hey, I'm gonna look at this book was the title, Why Good People Are Divided and my initial response is, no, we're not good. You know, we're all dead to Christ, you know, until his grace comes and saves us. And so I was like, ooh, that kind of, you know, just rubbed me the wrong way. Although I'm trying to get away from what I was taught and, and how, you know, we were taught how evil we are and how sinful and you know every sunday was like you know you got to confess your sin and or you can't take communion and you know i mean it was it was bad so i'm trying to get away from that um those 15 years of constant negativity um i but i think I, some of it just really rubs me the wrong way, but I want to be open, but just, you know, I have certain things highlighted in here and um, like one of the things that really struck me um, in the introduction was the sentence, once you see our righteous minds as primate minds with a hivish overlay, you get a whole new perspective on morality, politics, and religion. And I know we have a lot of similarities with primates and yes, we're mammals, but we're made in the image of God. And I believe, and, and, and I'm open. That's why I, I'm here and reading the book and studying it. But, I, you know, I keep hearing um, you say like, things are going downhill, you know, for the last, it hasn't been just the last four years. It's been the last, what, 50, I don't know, forever. It's just going downhill. And I think part of the problem, at least what I believe um, is, you know, they took prayer out of school and they took God out of school and they're, you know, they're, everything's just been stripped. And so of course we're gonna act animalistic if we 
I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to say anything because I don't want to offend. Well, Kelly, I want to engage that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and, and I was hopeful that we would have people from a variety of perspectives, not just all of us that fit comfortably into one political party or whatever, that we're living into this dialogue as well. So I agree with you that image of God is huge. G.K. Chesterton says, if you, you know, make the argument that 98% of an airplane is just a bunch of bolts and metal and all this, and 98% of a car is just bolts and metal and all that kind of, so therefore a car is the same as an airplane. It's like, no, one of them flies and one of them just stays on the ground. That's a pretty big difference. So he uses that argument to say, if you use the argument, well, we're 98% animal and primate and da -da, then let me ask you this. How did we end up being moral? How did we end up uh, being intelligent? How did we end up, we're more than just tool users. We are storytellers. We are sharers of music. We are connected with each other beyond just herd mentality. So I agree with you, that image of God thing I would disagree with the author saying, well, we're just primates that, and we, so C.S. Lewis plays with that as well and says, we're not just instinctual beings. Our morality is where we have two instincts that disagree with each other. For instance, he says, what if you hear somebody calling for help and they're drowning in a big body of water? And part of you feels the instinct, I should go save the person. And part of you feels the instinct, I should save myself. You have two animal instincts happening simultaneously. What makes us human beings is we think morally about that. We will make a choice to put our own life at risk in order to help somebody else. And that's more than just herd mentality. That's image of God stuff. That's kingdom of God stuff. That's self uh, sacrifice, which Jesus sets out for us. So we'll play with a, a lot of those conversations. Kelly, I'm glad you're part of this conversation because I think we need a variety of voices. And I'm, I'm sure if you could see us on screen, more than one of us were resonating with you like, yeah, I'm, I'm not claiming that I fit into a nice, simple category. I wrestle with some of these things as well. So yeah, no, I can I can see all of you on video and and I just want to make one last comment because you brought up the I read about the flag as well and it was she cut up the the old flag to clean her house mm. and part of me I literally started crying mm. because I have close people who have died fighting for this country and that flag means so much and even though she's doing it at home and no one can see her um to me it's a heart issue that that flag represents so much more and is not a rag um to be used to clean a toilet it's people die and have bled for that flag and if it's old and tattered okay dispose of it in a nice way but you don't need to clean the toilet or your floor with it and that was my initial gut reaction was just that people and people close to me have died for and bled for that flag they've lost legs and arms and it just seems so disrespectful but then from another country they'd be like oh who cares you know because they don't have that same tie-in with the american flag they might be like well that's a great way to use you know something old and get stuff done so it like you said it's there's two sides to every thing and what you just demonstrated and then we'll wind down is a great example thank you for your vulnerability to share that that something triggered in your emotions that brought you to tears. It was like, it just is so disrespectful. I can't believe anybody would do that. And yet your reasoning mind understands if I were a Brazilian, I probably wouldn't burst into tears over what happens to an American flag. What's going on in me? Well, it's my relatives that fought for that flag. It's my relatives that sacrificed. So 
something deep emotional that the flag is more than just a piece of cloth. The flag represents a whole belief system, a whole life, a whole bunch of other things. So I love you just demonstrated and reminded us something happens when tears come to my eyes and my heart is wrenched by something. And yet I need to figure out what do I think about this? What if I lived in another culture or whatever? So great example, Kelly. Jenny, you look like you've clicked off your uh, mute. Any last thought before Ryan wraps us up? No. <laughs> Ryan, back to you. Totally. Um, hey, I, I just want to, I want to thank every one of you for, for being in this. And, um, and I want to encourage as we go along that we all um, share the things that ping our hearts, whether they ping us in a good way or ping us in a bad way, share the pings. Um, there's a, a misunderstanding of the word unity that oftentimes we think unity equates uniformity. And um, that is not true at all. In fact, true, true unity is when we can take a group of people with diverse views and diverse perspectives and, and diverse stories um, and then still be able to look at the thing behind the thing and connect at a heart level behind it all. Um, in no way do we want to go through this book and create and leave all feeling like we're all the same, but we can all be unified. And there's this prayer in, I think it's John 4, Jesus is praying for for not only his disciples, but he talks about, he's praying for all the people that are going to believe because of what his disciples share in the world. And his one prayer there is for unity, not sameness, because he had in his language in Aramaic, if you speak in that at that time, there, there was plenty of language to say uniformity or sameness, but that's not what he prayed for. He, he prayed for unity that, um, that we would all be one just as him and the father are one. And that was his prayer for all. And, uh, <laughs> So I would just hope that as we go through this, there is no there is no need for all of us to be the same and for all of us to be uniform, but to be unified. And then hopefully prayerfully, these this book gives us the tools to be a catalyst of unity in this polarized world. And that that is that would be the answer to prayer for this whole conversation, um, whether whether we're in our undergraduate work or whether we're with mom or whether with the people, um, you know, in in our neighborhood that see things really differently than us. Um, Bruce, I want to swing back to, you wanted to tie it in. There were, there were two principles that we would learn the language. And I wanted you to get, just wrap us up back with those two principles. And then I'll tell about next time. And, and then we'll, we'll be watching our time <laughs> that way. Yeah, my, my suggestion, Ryan, is that we uh, catch up to chapter two. So we'll just Perfect. do one chapter each time. And then maybe later on, we'll pick up the pace, but just to get us engaged in this conversation. So my two points that I was making at the beginning, why I recommend this book is as a Christian, a follower of Jesus, if I'm ever going to connect my life with anybody else's life, I'm going to have to learn to build bridges, understand where they're coming from. No two human beings are exactly alike and building those relationships to share what is good, what is godly, who Christ is, what truth is, all of that. It's worth building the bridges and thinking like a missionary apologist of an evangelist. You know, I want to share what Christ has done in my life, speak their language. And the second one is blessed are the peacemakers. No bridge just happens on its own. Bridges have to be built. If you're going to get from one side to the other side, you're going to have to build a bridge and make a connection between two things that are not connected. So peacemakers are bu bridge builders. I'm committed to that. And I invite more of us to be bridge builders. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this. I love that this many people are interested in this book group. Woohoo! Thank you, Thank you. all. Um, may you go in grace and peace. And may God just bless your heart with a new wisdom that you feel as you, as you read this book, even from a professed atheist, that you would, this would be a conversation that you and God would dive into together, bring it to your family. I'm glad we have so much of the Haley family all together here and the Yoshitakes and like, just, it's a joy to see all of your faces. We'll be back again um, in two weeks on Sunday. So that would be the 28th. 
And uh, yeah, we'll go up to chapter two and uh, you'll get a couple emails in between. Have Rock on. Thank you, Bruce. All right. Love you guys. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.